if it only is David. Good morning. It's 9.30. Welcome to lecture two of algorithms and data structures. Let's launch right into it. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the idea of checking if something is in a collection of things. And we talked about that a little bit last time. Uh, we've done that before using the in keyword in Python, the programming course. So here's a piece of code that you should be able to understand that does this. So it takes in data, which is, say, a list, although it could be a tuple, it doesn't really matter, um, and a key that you're looking for. And it's just supposed to check. It's supposed to search inside data and say, is key in there or not, and return true or false. And here's how it works. Loop through all the elements in data. If you found the thing, return true, because it must be there if you found it. And if you get to the end and you still haven't found it, return false because it's not in there. And so here's some tests. Um, four should be in here. 1,000 should be in there. 2,000 should not be in here, et cetera, et cetera. And one should not be in the empty list. So um, we've talked about this a bit already, but what is the time complexity of this in terms of the length of the list, if we're calling that n? Linear, right. So it's linear. This is kind of the classic case of linear time complexity. You have n things. You need to look at each one of them once. And if there were twice as many things, it would take twice as long to look through the list because you're looping through the list. That's linear time. So the next question is, can we do better than linear time when we're searching for something? And uh, we're going to talk about an algorithm called binary search that can do better if the list is already sorted, meaning the smallest things on one side and the biggest things on the other side. So uh, who watched that video that I posted of uh, David Malin ripping up a phone book? OK. More than half of you. That's good. So um, I, I, as I mentioned in Slack, I wanted you to uh, watch the video because I think it's a more fun demonstration than what I would do, but to just briefly talk about how it works, uh, he's searching for a name in a phone book. And the idea of binary search is you're, you look in the middle, and a phone book is sorted. I guess no one really has phone books anymore, but it is sorted of alphabetically. Look in the middle. If the middle is M and your name, the name you're looking for starts with, I don't know, B, then you just take the first half, and then you look in the middle again. and you keep comparing the thing you're looking for to the middle element and just throwing away half, which you can always do if the array is sorted. So for example, here, uh, this list is sorted. If you're searching for 3, you can just check the middle element, which is 35. It's less than 3 is less than 35. So you never have to ever consider the right half of the list again, because it's sorted. And 3 is less than 35, so you save time. You get something better than linear because you're not actually going to look at every element inside of the list. Uh, and in fact, what you're doing is you're chopping the amount of stuff you need to look through in half every time. OK, so um, the doc string is relevant. Uh, the code is a bit of a mess, so I don't mind if you don't want to go through the code in detail. Certainly not right now. but. Uh, later on, you can go through this code in detail if you want. But it's basically keeping track of high and low, which is like, what part of the list am I looking at? I'm looking at from here to here. And that interval keeps getting chopped in half. OK, so I have some tests for this as well. Um, negative 12 is in here. 3,000 is not in here. Oh, no. Uh, I didn't run this. I didn't run this. OK. Didn't define the function. Um, so the question is, what is the time complexity of, of this? And uh, it was er already talked about in the video, so I guess uh, most of you know. Um, and the answer is log n. And I just want to talk a bit about why this is log n. So first of all, a comment on log. So um, 
logs have different bases, so you may have seen log base 2 or log base E or log whatever. Typically, in most contexts in life, uh, when someone just writes log, um, they're usually referring to log base E, also known as the natural log. Um, in computer science, the log base 2 is more relevant because things are typically in binary. And here, it's the fact that we're chopping things in half. That's where this base 2 comes from, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, however, when we're talking about big O, there's no point saying big O uh, log base 2 of n. It's just irrelevant to specify that 2 because all the logs are the same as each other except for some uh, multiplicative constants. So uh, log base A of x equals log base B of x. Now I'm going to mess this up. It's either log uh, A of B or, or B of A, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just some, it's just some constant. Um, not going to bother. OK, it's just some constant, either log A of B or log B of A. It has nothing to do with x. It's just a number like 2.1 or 0.7 or whatever. And we don't care about constants when we're doing big O. So you can just change it to whatever base you want. It's just going to be some log times some constant. And we're throwing away these constant factors anyways that have nothing to do with, I should, I'll just say uh, n to make it more clear. does not depend on n, so we don't care about that thing. So we can just write log, big O of log n, and we, it, it doesn't matter what base we're actually talking about. They're all the same big O. Anyways, typically in this class, we're going to think about base 2, because uh, that's, that's what we're dealing with. So why is, why is the number of steps for this binary search um, log base 2 of n? Well, log base 2 of n is the inverse function of 2 to the power of n. So with 2 to the power of n, you make n bigger by 1, and the thing doubles. Because you know 2 to the 6 is twice as much as 2 to the 5. This is the inverse operation of that. It says you double n, and the thing only goes up by 1. And that's exactly what we have with this binary search, because we have this list. And now we ask ourselves, well, how much work would we have to do if the list was twice as big? Just one extra chopping in half. We'd have this twice as big list. We'd look in the middle, throw away half of it, and now we're back to the original size list. So that is precisely log base 2 behavior. Doubling the size of the input only makes up the time go by one. And you can just imagine how very, very small that growth is um, because we're doubling and doubling and doubling and just slightly increasing the amount of work we have to do. So log n is a very, very slow growth, which is good because we like code to run quickly. Any questions or comments about this? Is it, by the way, A and B or B and A? Someone might as well just tell me. Is this right or backwards? Ah, no one cares. OK. <laughs> That's fine. I don't either. Um, OK, so next thing. Next question. What happens if you call um, search unsorted? That was our original function on sorted data. Let's start with that question. So search unsorted was the one that just loops through um, each thing. What if, you, what if you call that on sorted data? It's the same. Right, it, it, it makes no difference. Search unsorted is literally looking through every single element one by one. Whether you happen to sort it just for fun or not, it's not going to mess things up because it's just looking through all the things in a different order, but it will eventually find what it's looking for. And how about the other way around? What happens if you call search sorted on unsorted data? Yeah, it, it may be wrong. So it, it may not. Uh, it may not give the right answer because, for example, um, you, you look at the thing in the middle, you say, I'm, the thing I'm looking for is bigger than that element, so I'm going to throw away this half, but maybe it was actually in that half uh, because your array wasn't sorted. And so you, the whole algorithm relies on the assumption that it's sorted, and I can just say, oh, I'm looking for 3, this middle element is 5, so it definitely can't be in the right half because everything there is bigger than 5, but that assumption might be violated. OK, so that's that. You don't need to read it. 
Um, oh, here's an example. Great. Yeah. So searching for three, two, one. Search for one, it returns false, which is bad news. Another question for you. By the way, I'm just assuming for your own sake you're not like scrolling down and seeing the answer. I mean, you can, but uh, it will not be as fun. So um, why, why doesn't the search sorted function start by verifying that the list is indeed sorted? I guess what I'm trying to say is if you scroll down and read it, then maybe don't, don't answer. Yes, uh, Sam. I guess it would take a lot of computation relatively to do that. Exactly. It would take a lot of computation. So the whole beauty of this binary search thing is that it's faster than O of n. But how long is it going to take to check that the thing is sorted? Well, you have to just go through and make sure each thing is bigger than the previous thing. That itself is going to take O of n time. So it defeats the entire purpose of this fancy binary search O of log n to start it by doing an O of n operation, because then the whole thing is going to be O of n, and it's just pointless. Great. OK. Um, any questions or comments about this first section with uh, binary search? Yes, Tom. Does it take a lot of time to list them? Does it take a lot of time to sort the list? We will get to that later today. Good question. By the way, um, yeah, so last time we saw some O of n stuff, some O of 1 stuff, some n squared stuff. Now we've seen an example of log n. Um, and next week, we will see what code looks like that takes 2 to the n time, but uh, not this week. OK, so the next. 15 minutes or so is just going to be running code and measuring empirically how long it takes and then talking about it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take search unsorted and search sorted, and we're just going to run them. This code looks a little crazy, so let me just say what it's doing. I have a different sizes of my list. So we want to empirically see what happens when we make n bigger, right? That's what we've been talking about. What happens if I double n? So I'm going to be asking, what if I make n 10 times bigger, from 100 to 1,000 to 10,000? And then we're going to actually run the code for a list of length 100, and then a list of length 1,000, then a list of length 10,000, et cetera, and actually time how long it takes to get some empirical evidence backing up what we've been talking about. So what this code does is it loops through all the list sizes. So first it's 100. And then it just makes a random array of that size with random integers. That 10 to the 8 is just saying, pick random integers between 0 and 10 to the 8 minus 1, and make the size of the array list size, which the first time is going to be 100. So we have a 100 length list of random junk in there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to search whether the key is in there, and the key is just hard-coded up here to minus 1. The reason I'm searching for minus 1 is that I know it's not in there. I picked random numbers from 0 to some huge thing. And so that way, I know it's going to have to do the maximum amount of work, because it's going to have to keep looking, 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 and say, oh, I never found the thing. If I search for something that was in there, you just might get lucky and find it right away in the first step, and then it would kind of mess up the experiment. So that's why I'm searching for minus 1. Uh, because I know it's not in there. And then this time it thing we talked about last time. It's an IPython thing that allows you to time some code. And I'm just using some flags here that we don't really need to talk about uh, just to make the demo good. And then I'm storing how long it took in a variable called time. And I'm actually storing these in a dictionary called results so that we can look at all the results at the end. And, and this actually, uh, uh, a default dict, which um, is something you could use on your lab this week. I talked about it in lab yesterday afternoon. For those who have lab today afternoon, I'll talk about it with you as well. So I'm now running this code, and it's printing out uh, the list size. So first, it's doing list of size 100. And by the way, it's comparing a few different things. It's comparing uh, search unsorted, which was our linear time thing that we talked about. And it's comparing the Python in the default Python in operator, which is just does the same thing, except someone else wrote their code instead of I wrote the code. So just the default Python way of checking is this key in x. 
And then I'm actually sorting the thing so that it is sorted. And I'm not timing that. I'm just doing that separately. And then I'm uh, searching sorted using my code. And then I'm doing one last thing at the end, which is I'm casting x into a set. So it, used, it was a NumPy array when I created it. I'm making it into a set. And I'm just checking one last thing, which is how long does in take if it's a set? And we already saw last class that um, sets seem to be really good for this. So when we, were, we had some demos on Tuesday, it, apparently the in operation in Python was super fast when the thing was a set. So we're going to now look at that more quantitatively. And it's running. It's doing bigger and bigger and bigger lists. I really like this. I should do this more. Um, just so we can see what numbers we're dealing with. I think it is now done. So any questions about what we just did before we look at the results? Yes. I, I have a comment, actually. It's like, why don't you consider sort into your assignment? Because it, it's not fair to sort of like sort outside and then. Yeah, the question, why don't we consider sort into our timing? So we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but the quick answer is that if you know you're going to need to check whether something is in it many, 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 many times, it's going to be worth it to just sort it once. Uh, but if you're only doing the whole thing once, then it's actually not worth it to sort it. And yeah, we will talk more about that later. But we're just assuming we want to do this operation so many times that any overhead like sorting isn't that big of a deal. OK. So um, making this into a data frame. Tom is going to talk to you about data frames in the data wrangling course uh, over the next couple of weeks. But for now, it doesn't matter. I'm just doing this to print out the results. And here they are. So a useful skill is reading this type of table. Let me temporarily zoom in because we're going to want to talk about this a bit. OK, so first column is size. Again, that's the size of the list or array or whatever that we're searching inside of, length 100, length 1,000. And then this is the number of seconds for each different approach. So this is quite delightful because um, what we can see here, especially at the end, say going from 100,000 to a million, is that we've made the size 10 times bigger. And the amount of time took pretty much 10 times more, from 25, 26 milliseconds to 250 milliseconds. That's pretty much going up 10 times. And then it goes up 10 times again to 2.6 seconds. So that's exactly what we expected with linear time behavior. If I double the size of the thing, it's going to take twice as long. If I make the size of the thing 10 times, it's going to take 10 times as long. That is linear time behavior. And so we're really seeing it in the numbers. Um, within, something kind of funky is going on here. Uh, it is definitely taking longer. Um, as I make the thing bigger, but it also is just crazy fast in general compared to, to my code. Um, and maybe it's kind of going up 10 times here, like what is this, 10 milliseconds versus 0.8 milliseconds. I guess that's around 10 times, but the relationship's not as clear. And how about this binary search? So that's this log n behavior. We're pretty much getting, remember what we said, you double the workload. And the, um, and the time just goes up by a constant amount, like one second or whatever. That's pretty much what we're seeing here. I 10x the workload, and it goes up by three microseconds from five to eight. Then I 10x the size again, it goes up by three microseconds again, three again, two, five, whatever, close enough. It, it seems to be following that pattern. When I make the thing 10 times bigger, it's not taking 10 times as long. It's just taking some fixed amount longer, which is exactly logarithmic time complexity. So that is good stuff. And then Python set in is like so fast and um, not really a clear relationship, which is one of the things we talked about last time as well, that it appeared to just run an O of one time. So it, the, the time isn't really changing in a meaningful way as a function of the size. So it's not only O of 1, but it's blazingly fast, um, however many micro or nano section, seconds or whatever. OK. Any questions about mapping in our brains these numbers to those big O's?
So what is the behavior of uh, the unsorted list in here? What is the, the first column, unsorted list linear? No, just uh, like the right one to it. Unsorted list in? Yeah. Um, it is linear, but, but very fast. And uh, it's a bit hard to see the linear trend. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. But it, it should actually be linear. OK, so I, I'm not saying I will definitely do this, but like I feel it would not be unreasonable for me to show you something like this on a quiz without the headers and you know, for you to look at this column and say, oh, that looks like linear time as opposed to all these other things. So it's, it's, a, it's a way of thinking that I would like to get cultivated. OK, are these consistent with the time complexities? Da, 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 da. We already talked about this, so yes. Um, what is this? Oh, this is the plot. Beautiful. OK, so this is those same numbers, but visualized in a plot. Uh, Firas is going to be teaching you Altair this block as well, so you'll be generating plots like this shortly. But here we can see the same things. Unsorted list is pretty much linear. It kind of looks like a straight line. Um, the second one, that's the one you're asking about, Furkan. That's this red one. It gets linear eventually, but you can't see it right away. Um, and that's probably because there's some overhead thing that I talked about last time. Like maybe it just can't be faster than whatever that is, 10 microseconds, because there's just something it has to do all every time. And so that's just like a, you know, a fixed cost. And so you can't see that linear behavior originally. But then once it gets bigger and things take longer, you can start to see that. Uh, linear relationship towards the end. So the orange one is the, the one that we claimed is log n. You can't really see that it's log n just by eyeballing this. We could see it from the table of numbers. All we can see here is that the orange thing is growing very slowly, but we can't say, oh, that's obviously log n just by looking at it. And then the blue thing is the set, and that uh, does appear fairly constant. It's, there's no real growth. Questions about this picture? Yes, right. Kind of like even larger data sets, but you eventually start seeing like a block uh, Well, uh, the question was if you had even larger s data sets, would you eventually start seeing the log? But we're already seeing the log here. It's just, it, it is a difficult skill to just eyeball something and say, oh, that's obviously log. But we will transform the axes in a second to make it more obvious what we're looking at. So other than you know, the details of what we're talking about here, let's just revisit the big picture that, wait a minute, different ways of doing things behave really differently. And I would love to have the blue thing and not the green thing, because that looks way better. Um, so again, like to try to tie this back into real life, uh, we probably care about the difference between these if we're dealing with large amounts of data, because one is just getting worse and worse and worse, and the other one is just going almost instantly regardless. So if you had to do this operation on 10 million items and you had to do it a million times, now that's a million seconds that you're just sitting there waiting instead of less than one second. So obviously that makes a big difference to your data science well-being. OK. Um, da -da -da -da. Right. Oh, yes, this. I want to talk about this part. I want to talk about the part where the orange thing is bigger than the red thing. Because that, remember, the orange thing is O of log n, and the red thing is O of n. And that's something I tried to talk about last time. I said, well, O of log n is usually better than O of n, but we cannot say it is always definitely going to be faster. And here's the case in that segment when n is less than around 10,000. Actually, the O of n thing is a bit better than the O of log n thing simply because it is a way better implementation. And um, the O of log n thing, the binary search that we wrote, it does fewer steps. It just keeps chopping the thing in half, so it's only doing like 30 steps or whatever, um, 20 steps, which is great. Uh, whereas the red thing is really doing, is it this, is it this, is it this, is it this? It's just really good at doing that because someone who made pythons in uh, a function was really good at what they were doing, and so it's really fast. So the, the red thing is actually doing more steps, 
but each step is so fast that when n is small, it still comes out ahead. So I, it's something like, something like this case. Maybe the orange one is something like 1,000 log n. Each step takes like 1,000 units of time. And uh, you're doing very few steps, only log n steps. And the, the red thing is something like n. Like each step only takes one unit of time, but it's doing more steps. So when n is sufficiently small, you will actually see the linear time one faster. And then they're going to eventually cross for some n. So that's why I was saying this big O thing is especially valid when n is large. Questions? Yes, Sam. The, uh, the red line, the unsorted list, it kind of looks like it's almost going to be quadratic. Um, well, it's not. I mean, we, we know it shouldn't be because, I mean, wh like, why would it be? It's just searching if some, you know, if, if this is in that, it really needs to look through them. It, it's not actually quadratic. Uh, well, yeah, it's just something weird that if we extended n even bigger, it, it would look linear. Okay. And the aqua blue one, it's also linear, right? Yes. Yes, the aqua blue one is also linear. Again, it's not going to be perfect. Who knows why there's this bump here, something else going on in my operating system, or bad luck, or whatever. Who knows? Yeah. OK. Um, right. Note, the stuff we just talked about is not easy and important. So um, there's things going on here, hopefully. And uh, feel free to revisit this ask questions on Slack or in lab. Uh, this is kind of a core piece that we just talked about. <coughs> so any more questions before we move on? Some water. Let's see what's next. Oh, OK. So Ryan was asking how we can see that the orange thing is logarithmic. And one thing we can do is transform the axes so that instead of having n on the x-axis, we actually have log n. Or we take a logarithmic scale for uh, n. And then um, if you're plotting running time versus log n, then that orange thing should just look like a straight line. Because the orange thing is, as far as the running time versus log n is concerned, that's just a identity relationship. So I just, again, you'll learn this in the viz course, but I'm setting the x-axis to log. Um, and so now you can see the x-axis is kind of squished onto a log scale. And the orange thing looks straight line-ish, um, which is consistent with it being logarithmic time. Whereas the, the blue thing is still constant because it was always constant. And it doesn't matter if we change the axis. So that's just a small aside, um, not critical. OK, how are we doing for time? I'm going to scroll up to the top for a minute. We're 30 minutes in and, ooh, great, 30 minutes in, right on schedule. OK, next thing, sorting. So we sorting is like a classic thing in these types of algorithms and data structures, of course, just because it's like an elegant, fun uh, application or, or algorithm. Um, this insertion sort is the thing we saw last class. We just didn't call it insertion sort, I don't think. But this is the exact code we saw last class, um, just with some comments added. So you want to sort, sort um, this list x. You loop through it. And then same as last time. You, you take the remaining part of the list, so x from i onward. You say, what's the index of the smallest thing? Uh, that plus i is just to deal with some housekeeping issues. Uh, actually, I can, there's maybe a way to avoid this going the other way. Anyways, um, you find the index of the smallest thing, and then you swap it with the current location. So now at the current location, you have the smallest thing of what's left. Then you move on to the rest of the array. You say, what's the smallest thing in here? Oh, it's, oh, it's that thing. OK, I'll swap. Now it's here. Then what's the smallest thing in the rest of the array? Oh, it's that thing. OK, I'll swap. And you just keep doing that. And then by the end, you have the smallest on one side and the biggest on the other side. So um, that's what this code is doing. Uh, what is the time complexity? Well, we kind of gave that away last time we talked about it. It's O of n squared. To remind you, that was the thing over here with the arithmetic series, uh, the n, n minus 1 etc. where we summed it all up and said, well, that's pretty much just O of n squared. So um, this argmin is having to chomp on smaller and smaller arrays. But at the end of the day, uh, this is 
quadratic time complexity. Okay, so yes, someone asked about uh, the time complexity of sorting. And so let me ask you this hypothetical question. Could we come up with a sorting algorithm that ran in O of log n time, do you think? Is that a reasonable goal if I'm a sorting researcher? James, no, why not? Uh, because as far as we know, the fastest you can sort a list is n log n. Okay, but, but, but we're researchers, James. So as far as we know is not far enough. We want to take this to the next level. So wh why not even try that? Um, Oh, 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 fair? Uh, you'd have to check each element to actually check that it's all in order. Right. So uh, for those who didn't hear, um, as part of sorting something, you would have to at the very least look at each thing in the list. And in fact, you have to do more than look at it. You have to move them around and whatever. But you cannot sort a list without at least inspecting each element in the list. And that already takes linear time. Because if there's n things in the list, Looking at that is going to take n operations, and so that's an O of n um, thing you need to do. And so it wouldn't really make sense to be able to sort something faster than the time it even takes to look at something. So that's why um, O of log n would not be a reasonable goal. You could think maybe there's a sorting algorithm in O of n time. It turns out there isn't, as, as James correctly pointed out. The, it's, it's O of n log n, which is pretty close. Um, it's good enough. So yes, real answer is the best sorting algorithm for n log n. This is close enough. O of n was like our hypothetical best result because that's how long it takes to just look at everything. O of n log n is pretty much the same thing as far as I'm concerned because log is a super small thing that we don't worry too much about. So um, this is pretty good. The people did a good job figuring out sorting. Um, we will need to wait until next week to actually talk about how you get this O of n log n uh, sorting algorithm. But for now, uh, you could read more about some of these sorting algorithms if you want. I have posted some links. Questions about that? What's your name again? Aman. Aman. Uh, what is the time complexity of the sorting function of default uh, sorting function of Python? The question is, what is the time complexity of the Python default sorting? It's almost certainly n log n. Um, I, I guess it probably uses quick sort, which that muddies the waters a little bit because there's some randomness in the algorithm. We're not really talking much in this course about uh, randomized algorithms and. There's some more sophisticated analysis out there than what we're doing, like what is the worst case time complexity, what is the average case, kind of like expected value of how long it's going to take, what is the best case. We're just kind of sweeping that under the rug, and so we could just call it n log n. OK, break. So it's 10.03. Let's resume at 10.08. So let's talk about this magical thing, the Python set that we've been so impressed by last class and today that seems to be able to do things in O of one time, which is pretty cool. I mean, it's saying no matter how much stuff you have in there, you can just look for something in a fixed amount of time. And we saw that empirically. I mean, we did the experiment and it seems to hold up, um, which is pretty great. So let's talk about it. How would we implement a set? So, um, well, we could just, like if we were making set ourselves, well, you can just put everything in a list and do loop through it, um, like our search unsorted thing, but that's not going to be O of one time. That's going to be linear time. We already know that's not good enough. Uh, and then we talked about binary search. So binary search can search in log n time, which it's not quite O of one, but it's very good. Um, but the problem is when we want to put something in, when we want to insert, because search is not the only operation you need to be able to do, if you want to insert something into the set, and if you're just using a sorted list, you would have to find the right place to insert it. Um, and so that would take, I guess, O of n time as well. Um, and yeah, okay, these things should take around, 
ah, O of log n time, uh, which is not O of 1. So there's something called uh, a hash table, which is actually how a set is implemented that has this very nice O of 1 property. Um, and then there's also trees. Um, well, could also work. They would also be log n. So they would also be reasonable uh, way of implementing a set. Um, and I believe in lab two, you will actually implement your own set data structure using trees, if I remember correctly. Uh, so those are log n as well. They're not uh, O of 1. And so hash tables are, are O of 1, and they're, they're super popular. Probably that's part of the reason. So first thing is there's a hash function that's built into the language, built into Python. So you can just call hash without importing any library. So I could hash the string MDS, and I could hash the empty string. And it seems so far that hash just takes something and turns it into an integer, which is part of what it does. I could hash this float, I get an integer. I could hash this integer, I get an integer. I could hash this integer, I get an integer. So it seems that um, for these integers, Python, the hash of it is just itself. OK, that's just a curiosity, not really the main point. If I hash a number that's too big, maybe it gives me something else. Um, and if I hash this list, then I get an error that says list, list type is unhashable. So uh, it does not implement the ability to hash itself, whereas the tuple is fine uh, and none is fine. So um, mutable objects are typically not hashable. And you may have noticed from 5.11 that we talked about you cannot use lists as a key inside of a dictionary. And it's actually com coming back to this. So in order for something to be a key in a dictionary or inside of a set, it needs to be hashable. OK, so I can make a set. And I can add these hashable things to it. And I cannot add this unhashable thing to it. So apparently set is calling that hash function somewhere that I was just showing you. And if it tries to call that hash function doesn't work, then it, it's not going to add it to your set. OK, so now I've added to my set the tuple 1, 2, 3, the float 5.5, and the string MDS. So what is a hash table? And how does it use the hash functions? Basically. A hash table is a list of lists that is set up in a very clever way, or really an array of lists. We're not going to really make that distinction. Um, but here's what it does. It, mm, let me show you the code and then talk about it. I changed my mind about the order. Let's do, look at the code and then let's talk about it. So here is a small piece of code for a hash table in Python. You've seen constructors by now. And so it's going to have this thing called the number of buckets. So I said it's pretty much a list of lists. Um, the number of buckets is the size of that outer list. So four buckets is just basically there's four spots where we can put stuff inside of our hash table. And what I'm doing in the constructor is I'm initializing an empty list inside. Uh, I'm initializing four empty lists here if we have four buckets. So um, if I run this code now and I just print the hash table immediately, you can just see it's a list with four empty lists inside of it. And the stuff we put into the set is going to go inside of those inner lists. Um, and somehow this is going to be super fast, which we'll, which we'll talk about. So I have to decide on this thing, which is the number of buckets. I picked four just for illustration purposes. You would have more in a real hash table. And so far, there's nothing interesting. So let's talk now where it gets interesting. How do I add something? Well, first I check if it is in there already. If it's in there already, if, then I'm not going to do anything. Because remember, sets cannot have duplicates. They just have unique elements. So if five is in my set, I try to add five again. I can just do nothing um, because it's already in there. So if it does not already contain the item, then we need to do something. And here's, here's the, the key, this line of code. So I'm going to hash the item, which remember gets me that giant weird integer that we looked at. We, we hashed a whole bunch of things a couple minutes ago and got some giant weird integer out of it. And I'm going to mod it with uh, the number of buckets, which is 4. So that remind you that percent sign, we just touched on it for a second in 5.11. 
but it is the mod operator, which means divide by 4 and take the remainder. So if the number is divisible by 4, it's going to be 0. If it's a number like 5 or 9 or 13, it's going to return 1 because the remainder is 1. If it's a number like 6 or 10 or 14, it's going to return 2, etc. Um, and so, in other words, if I mod, if I just take any weird integer coming out of this hash and I mod 4, the only possible things that could be is 0, 1, 2, or 3. Because I'm dividing by 4 and taking the remainder. So, you know, 17 mod 4 is 1 uh, because it's 16 plus 1, and, and uh, 10 mod 4 is 2 because 8 plus 2, etc. Okay, so the, that's good because I already created an array or an outer list with four lists in it. And since I'm using this to index into it, I had better get something that's only returning 0, 1, 2, or 3 because those are the only valid numbers that I could index into a list of length 4. It only has four spots, spot 0, spot 1, spot 2, and spot 3. So that is at least reassuring that hash item percent 4 is going to give me 0, 1, 2, or 3. So in other words, Oh, and then, and then I'm just appending. So, so now I'm grabbing the particular sublist, sublist 0, 1, 2, or 3, and I'm just sticking the item in there. So for example, I can add hello. It stuck it in that particular bucket. And the reason it stuck in that particular bucket is because the hash of hello is this weird thing. But hey, when you mod that with 4, you get 2. And so it went into position 2 inside, inside of our hash. Remember, we're indexing from 0. So the leftmost is position 0, then position 1, then position 2. Um, and now when I'm calling contains, check if the thing is in there, I'm going to get myself to that particular bucket in the same way. And then I'm just using regular in, uh, which is just going to do linear search within the bucket. So you might be thinking, well, how is this possibly going to be O of one time? I just said the words linear search while I was talking. And so this could only possibly work if you don't have too much stuff in a given bucket. So let's add more things to the hash table. We added hello already. Let's add goodbye. It just happened to go in bucket one because the hash of goodbye, um, whatever it does, I added test. I added item. So here, we got two item, We got two things in the same bucket. So the hash of test and the hash of item, it just so happens, whatever this hash thing is doing, that weird function, when I divided them by 4, I got a remainder of 3 in both cases. So they both went into bucket 3, which means if I want to look for that later on, then I'm going to have to uh, search. You know, If I'm looking for item, I'm going to look in bucket 3, and I have to say, is it test? No. Is it item? Yes. So, um, that's the general idea. I will talk a bit more about why it's constant time and what this hash function is doing, but let me first take questions about what we've seen so far. Uh, Gaurav. Does the hash function works different, give different value in different systems? Yeah, does the hash function give different value? Yeah, so if you're following along on your laptop, you're going to get something different. The hash function has a random seed that is set uh, every time you launch the kernel. So if you went restart kernel in Jupyter and did it again, you would get something different. So that you're going to get different things from me for sure, but but it's fine. fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if, if I hash the same thing a million times, it's going to give me the same thing back. So it's it's only if I restart the whole system, then everything will be in different places. But I'm just going to be retrieving it within the same session, so it's fine. Set. Could you explain uh, the mod for part again? Can I explain the mod for? Yes. So the way this hash table is going to work is it is going to use this hash function, which we haven't talked about much yet, but it's a function that takes something and gives you an integer. It's going to use that weird integer to decide which bucket the thing goes in. Now, I have some predefined number of buckets, in this case four, maybe a thousand in some other hash table. So I need to get some way of taking a weird integer and turning it into 0, 1, 2, or 3, because those are my four possible positions in the hash table. So mod 4 does exactly that, because when I take a number, an integer, and I mod 4, 
then the only possible results are 0, 1, 2, or 3. Basically, is it a multiple of 4, or a multiple of 4 plus 1, or a multiple of 4 plus 2, or a multiple of 4 plus 3? That's the only options, because a multiple of 4 plus 4 is, again, a multiple of 4. So it just allows me to then decide which bucket uh, to put the thing in. Jerome. So then for the hash table, if you made more buckets, you would then get smaller. The contains from Faster, yes, exactly. If I had more buckets, I would have fewer what's called collisions, which is this thing, stuff happening in the same bucket. So there is now this trade-off between memory or space complexity we talked about last time and, and speed or time complexity. Because if I have more buckets, then that's going to take up more memory because I need to allocate this big chunk of memory. Stuff could go here, 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 here. But it's going to be faster. So that is exactly a trade-off of hash tables. And it is, that trade-off is handled in a very clever way in real industrial strength hash tables in that the number of buckets is actually changing dynamically as you're adding more stuff to it. It says, oh, there's, it's too crowded. I'm going to expand and um, make myself more buckets. That expansion is actually kind of a slow operation that takes time. So you have to re-put things in the right place. But as long as you're not doing that too often, it manages that space-time trade-off very elegantly and gives you O of one time in general. Any? In this example, though, because test and item will always return, you would never add and put it in a new bucket even if you had an extra bucket. Right? Ah, but you would. So the question was, you wouldn't put this in a new bucket even if you had an extra bucket. And the answer is you would, because if you had more buckets, like you had six buckets now, or eight, or whatever. Now instead of uh, mod four, when you decide where to put it, you're going to do mod whatever the number of buckets are. And so they may not uh, collide anymore because maybe one of the maybe one of the hashes just a minute maybe one of the hashes is four and one of them is eight. Um, and so mod four, they're both zero. But mod eight, one is going to be zero and one's going to be four. So they'll actually get split into two buckets if you're modding it. OK, what's your follow-up? But if you kept mod for yes. that bucket would always remain empty. Absolutely. But um, when you change the number, of, you're always modding the number of buckets so that they're kind of spread across all the buckets that you have. Yes? Can you give an example of how we would use this in real life? Because we would never do this. Can I give you an example of how we'd use this in real life? I just want you to know how set works or like dictionaries and stuff because you're going to be using them a lot. And um, it is nice to fundamentally know how you achieve constant time for this kind of thing. Do I expect you to be implementing this? No. But do I expect you to be making decisions between should I use a set or this or that or whatever? Yes. And occasionally when you're getting into the details of it, it's nice to know what's under the hood, like how does it work? There was another question. OK, Sam? Guys, if we have enough buckets, does that guarantee we don't have collisions? Or if we have enough buckets, does that guarantee we don't have a collision? No. I mean, you could always get unlucky. But again, like having tiny amounts of collisions is not a big deal. If the amount of stuff in each bucket is O of 1, then doing that linear search is, is O of 1. Um, so basically, when I did bigger and bigger sets in my experiment, uh, it was automatically using more and more buckets. And so it was just making it all stay as fast as it promised it would be. Just a minute, Tony. OK. Is it Brandon? Yeah. Brandon. Yeah, just piggybacking on Annie's comment. So basically, this is just giving us the context to understand why the search is so efficient on a set? Yes. Okay. This is just giving you context to understand why the search is so efficient on a set. Tony. A larger amount of buckets does not guarantee less collisions because a larger module could act funny based on the numbers and they end up. Correct. So one thing we haven't talked about yet and we will not really talk about in much detail is the hash function. So if you have a bad hash function, then all bets are off. Because if you say have the most ridiculous hash function that whatever thing it, you give it, it returns zero, then no matter what you do, everything's just going to go in that first bucket and it's going to be a disaster. So, um, Coming up with good hash functions is way beyond the scope of what we're doing here. But someone has thought it through, rest assured, to come up with hash functions that tend to work well in practice. Uh, yeah, let's see what oh, wait, Sora? Sora. Sora, OK. Like, if you did, 
If you add the same item many times, it's just going to do nothing because one of the behaviors of a set is that it doesn't have duplicates. So it, uh, you can't have the same number in a set multiple times. And in fact, that's what this part of the code is right here. It's just saying, oh, I'm only going to try to add it if it's not already in there. If it's already in there, just don't even bother trying to add it because that's not what a set is. A set is a collection of unique elements. Rock. Rock. Yeah, yeah. Can you explain how this is related to the fast searching of sets? Can I explain how this is related to the fast searching of sets? Yes. So if I don't have a lot of stuff in any bucket, then think about the time complexity of this contains. The contains function is the searching that we were talking about before. It says, is something in here or not, true or false? Um, so here's what contains needs to do. It just needs to hash the thing which is fast. It needs to do a mod, which is fast. It needs to grab the relevant sublist or the relevant bucket inside of this hash table, which is fast. And then it has to search through that sublist to check if the thing is in there. But say you only had one thing in that sublist, or two, or O of one things in that sublist, then that's fast too. So then every single operation there contains is just O of one time. And so then regardless of n, regardless of how much stuff we have in there, contains is still O of one time. So is this basically how <coughs> sets work? This is basically how sets work, except this is kind of a not very sophisticated version of it. For example, this is just fixed at four buckets. It doesn't dynamically change the number of buckets, but this is the general idea of what's going on. Rayco. Yeah, so just going back to this example, so what you're basically doing when you are looking for a specific thing is you're saying, well, when I hash it, like, it tells me that it should be in bucket four. Uh -huh. Let's go into bucket four. Yes. Actually, yes. Four. Correct. When I'm searching and I hash something and then I mod it with four and I get two, that means if it's in there, it could only possibly be in bucket two because when I put it in in the first place, I use the same hash function to decide where to put it. Thanks. Correct. Uh, uh, Derek. <coughs> this function or this class just shifted the time to the creation of the set, the first sort, and then all subsequent sorts are kind of quick. OK, good question. The question was, did this just shift the time to the creation of the set? So not, not quite. Um, so there's no sorting going on here at all. The, the, the binary search thing we did required the thing to be certain. But here, um, yes, it is true that when I'm creating the set, if I'm just putting the things in one at a time, I don't know exactly how the Python set works. But it's definitely going to be slower than just creating a list because it's going to be d hashing the stuff, shuffling them around, whatever. So yes, the creation is going to be a bit slower, but not that much slower. And I think I have some stuff on that. L let me just first see if I covered all the bases here. Um, OK, one thing I just want to say here is this word uh, amortized. So um, I talked about how the, the growth and the shrinking of the array, like changing the number of buckets, could be slow. But basically, if you don't have to do it very often, then overall, it still looks like O of one time. So it is OK to sometimes do slow operations if you do them very rarely. Then if you amortize or average over, you do a million operations on the set, uh, it kind of averages out and still behaves like O of one time, which is what we saw when we tested it empirically. So I wanted to mention that. Um, I think we talked about the rest of these. So let me go down here. Um, OK. So to, to answer your question about the creation of things, so first of all, I encourage you to time it as well. You know, you can time how long it takes to create the thing. But basically, um, this is going to be a common pattern in algorithms and data structures is, yeah, sometimes you have to do a bit more work up front. If you're literally just going to do one lookup operation, don't bother with this, right? Just do a linear search in your list. But it's very common that you want to build the data structure, like my set of, of objects, and then I want to query it a bunch of times. Um, and in that case, it'll often be very much worth it um, to, to build the set to begin with. But exactly how much longer it takes is going to depend on all the details. Generally speaking, if you're looking up things in a giant collection, you probably want to use a set. OK. Um, see how we are for time. Maybe we're 
Okay. Uh, okay. So I just want to talk about dictionaries now. Dictionaries are pretty much the same thing as sets. All the stuff we just talked about applies to dictionaries. The only difference is that with the sets, we basically only had the keys. And with dictionaries, we have keys and values. So basically, with dictionaries, um, I put something in. And it's not just the thing itself, like hello. But it is the key, hello, and a reference to some payload of other stuff, which is what we were calling the value. But all this, when you want to look things up, it's all based on the key. So everything we just talked about applies to the keys of a dictionary. And then when you finally find the thing at the end, you're like, oh, and here's the value associated with that key. So again, you cannot have the key hello in a dictionary twice, just like you cannot have the string hello in a set twice. The keys have to be unique. So here's a dictionary. Um, here, 5 is the key. A is the value. Here, B is the key. Uh, 9 is the value. I can print out the dictionary. It looks like this. And the in operator in Python, when I check is 5 in D, that's checking the keys. It is not checking the values. So is 5 in the dictionary? Yes. Is 9 in the dictionary? No. Because it's just checking is 9 a key in the dictionary. Because those are, again, going back to the analogy with sets, it's really like the keys that are the important part. And the values are just um, like some extra stuff hanging around, basically. So d of 5 gives me a, d of 6 gives me a key error, because 6 is not a key in the dictionary. And then I cannot have all the, oh, <laughs> um, all the errors we had before with sets, it's going to be the same with dictionaries. I could not make a list uh, element in a set. I cannot make a list a key in a dictionary. It's not hashable. All that stuff carries over. This is fine. The value can be a list. The value is not getting hashed. It's, it's not used for the searching. It's just hanging around there once the search is complete. Um, some dictionary comprehension stuff we saw in 5.11. Um, nested dictionary. So here is a dictionary. F is a dictionary. And then I'm making F as a value in dictionary G. So you cannot have a dictionary as a key to another dictionary. But you can have a dictionary as a value to another dictionary, which is what I'm doing here. And in fact, what you do in the lab uh, exercise four, where you have a dictionary of dictionaries. Questions or comments? <coughs>